Hello. Can you hear me all right? Is it coming I, through? I can hear you fine, Chris, and good morning. Good morning, good morning. And uh, hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to another conversation about uh, the Kundalini experience that you may be having. Uh, the uh, the title of, t- of today's uh, conversation is about 2012 and the new year with regards to Kundalini. Well, I would like to congratulate everybody for surviving the uh, the the end of the world that was that was uh, advertised so steadily, uh, you know, during the 2012 year. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions now. Well, why, Kristen, why didn't that happen? What, you know, were, were all the ancient cultures wrong? Were were the 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 the, uh, the you know some people were going to the ET thing? Were the ETs wrong? Were the spirits wrong? What happened with 2012? How come we're still here and, and we haven't been destroyed? Um, well, first of all, you know, for me, this was never about the end of the world. This was never about the destruction of the world. It was, you know, more about a, a beautiful occurrence, uh, an opening to a greater level of, of spiritual uh, input and vibration. And I don't know if any of you noticed, but I did notice that uh, there was a definite increase in chronic energy uh, here, at least here in, in Northern California, North America, uh, you know, from from about November all the way to, to the present moment. A very, very definite increase in in the in the chronic energies, which a person would feel um, in the areas of vitality or or sexual interest, think you know things along that level. Uh, this this definitely occurred, and it occurred to more than one person. Just you know, it wasn't just Prism out there going, "Wow, this is this new energy is really great." There are other people that have also come to me with regards to that, uh, and so. You are in that transformation that 2012 uh, brought. Just because the buildings didn't fall down and the California didn't fall into the ocean, massive floods didn't occur, doesn't mean that the transformation uh, given through the 2012 prophecies weren't correct. What it does mean is perhaps the modern-day interpretation of those ancient uh, understandings were misinterpreted. They, you know, if you talk to any of the Maya, uh, you know, down there, they this wasn't the end of the world. This was the end of that part of their calendar. So it, it gives us a, a moment to pause about how much we buy in to fear propaganda. Oh my gosh, you know, the end of the world is coming. Uh, how much we bought into that. Now, I think that it served a positive purpose to a degree. I think it gave people an opportunity to prepare themselves for for disaster whenever disaster strikes. Uh, Disaster is always a present uh, situation on this world. I mean, you know, we don't know if the magma in the earth is going to destabilize a certain region and allow earthquakes to happen or... You know, and, and, and if that earthquake happens out in the ocean, well, is it going to be a, a tsunami? You know, we don't know. And, and, and that's part of of living here on this world in a physical body with a five, five cent limited uh, uh, discernment uh, properties that we have, you know, typically expressing in our bodies. With Kundalini, you get a lot more. But... Most people, you know, they, they don't have that. And so it was a good opportunity for people to get prepared. Did you put together, you know, a bag of, of tools and food and water and, and some of the things that you would need to be able to survive any kind of a, of a, uh, of a disaster had that occurred? You see, that, that to me was the very positive aspect of the 2012 fear uh, projections. It allowed people that opportunity, and I would encourage 
everyone listening to, it's not too late to put that bag together. It's not too late to, you know, put a little food aside, a little water aside, a little medication aside, whatever you need. Put that aside and just leave it alone. And if, you know, if, if that disaster strikes your area, wherever you are in the world, well, then you have that extra leverage on, on, in surviving it. And so, once again, I do encourage everybody to do this. Uh, and I, and I, once again, I, I do want to congratulate everybody for, for listening to this, to our broadcast here. I'd like to thank Amelia Santara, uh, Barbara Berry, and, and uh, many of the other people uh, who, who support uh, the Kundalini Awakening Systems One program and our outreach. Uh, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but Kundalini is on the move. More and more and more people are coming in to this gift. And it's very, very important for people to understand that, one, they're not going crazy. Two, this is a natural part of the human expression. And three, uh, you know, to be able to walk in, in the divine and the mundane at the same time. Uh, this is a big paradigm shift. The Kundalini Awakening is a big paradigm shift for people. And I cannot tell you how important it is for people to have just a little bit of good information that allows them to to understand and to be able to put into context and reference, you know, these these very, very uh, profound experiences that they're having. Uh, with regard to the new year, we did, as I mentioned before, there is that energetic increase that has occurred. It is, it has not gone away. It is still here. And I want to, to encourage, uh, the people, you know, who are experiencing this, experiencing this to call in. Call in and, and, uh, you know, talk about this. Also, uh, we're still kind of new with our with the blog talk uh, radio uh, format here, and uh, if 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 there is good clarity in our broadcast, can you let us know? Give us give uh, Centara a call and let us know if we need to make any adjustments in our audio. It, you know, it's difficult for me. I don't have any kind of a feedback speaker here that tells me whether the audio is coming through cleanly or not. Uh, anyway, Actually, so may, I, may I interrupt you, Chrism? Yes. Um, I did receive some feedback, and apparently the introduction, there was a lot of static, and yours also at the beginning. But my understanding is it has settled down now. So if that is not the case, maybe somebody could let us know. Thank you. It's, thank you, Sarah. And thank you for the caller for the caller who, who, who helped us with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm using a, a cell phone and a Bluetooth attachment to the cell phone, so I want to make sure that, that you know, the, the words are coming out cleanly and clearly. And, and so once again, thank you for the person who called in. 2013, uh, this is the year of information. And it's not to say that disasters won't occur in this year of information. Of course, every year we have disasters somewhere on the globe. Um, and we, you know, this is something that we, we, have to, we have to take as we live on this world. We, we live by the many, many different uh, vibrations of reality on this world. Uh, you know, when you're walking through the forest and you step on an anthill, well, that is a disaster for that anthill, you know, and those creatures have to rebuild. Well, the same thing happens to the little human anthills that we call cities. And, you know, sometimes, you know, one or two or, or more of those cities will get stepped on by the environment or by other, other uh, forces that force us to come into a, a, a mode of, of repair, rebuilding. Uh, with Kundalini, I'm going to suggest that you open yourself completely to your Kundalini and bypass, as much as you can, 
bypass any discarnate entity interference. A lot of the Kundalini people, uh, early on in their in their process, you know, they'll hear their name called, or they'll hear, they'll hear voices uh, talking to them, and, and these would be, you know, in a in a in a mundane format, these would be called, you know, people would think they're spirits talking to them. Well, they indeed are, but they are not. You know, just because they're a spirit doesn't mean they're truthful. Uh, entities of a certain vibrational level lie consistently. They consistently tell uh, untruths in order to manipulate a certain sequence of events. Uh, so I would encourage people who, who are really inside of their kundalini right now to forget about the voice that they may be hearing unless they have definitive proof and understanding that this voice is being helpful and is not in any way self-serving. Remember, kundalini really in the human is about expressing divine love upon and within the the environment. So within the, the, the body of the person having the kundalini and outside upon the environment that the body is living within. It is not about manipulating events for self-gain. It is not about expressing anger or retribution through through divine tools of, of malevolence. This is not what the Kundalini is about. This would be more about what uh, uh, the lower entity instruction would be. I want you to be very, very cogent of that. Let's look at some of the current events that we've seen uh, certainly in the United States, uh, the, 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 the young man who, who killed those children and those, and the instructors and the adults there, uh, this person was evidently taking, uh, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, these types of medications can dissolve to a, to a degree the barriers, the natural barriers that the human psyche has uh, to, to keep uh, predatory entities from coming in and trying to take control. Uh, this, this young man didn't have those barriers anymore. He, he just like the Columbine kids and, and many of the other people that, that do these types of activities, they have been in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases taken over by lower level discarnate consciousness. Okay, uh, so I want to express uh, caution for people who are doing what the voices tell them to do. You have a responsibility to your kundalini to discern that which is helpful, that which is of service, and that which is is reaching into the populations in a positive way, a positive equation. Uh, this is something that I'd like you to look at for the new year. Let your kundalini reach in to your social environment and your, 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 you know, your, your physical environment in a positive, love-based way. One of the most important ways to do this is through extreme forgiveness. Kundalini is a force that turns people into saints and angels. I never used to feel, you know, I, I wasn't brought up in a religious way at all. Uh, my mother, uh, I, I would ask her, well, Mom, why do I have to go to church on Christmas and Easter? And she'd say, so you can learn some manners. <laughs> she kind of gives you an idea what kind of a kid I was. Uh, so I never really, you know, I was just there, you know, Basically, it was a waste of time for me. But with, with regards to the idea of an angel, the idea of a, of a saint, these, these are true divine blends. These are divine equation blendings that turn the human body into a divine expression, more so than it already is. 
yes, yes, yes. You know, everything is is divine. Everything is made of, you know, from from the 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 all that is. But there are stronger emanations and there are weaker emanations. And in in regards to the Kundalini effect upon the human system, that is a very strong emanation of divinity compared to the five sense emanation that is currently uh, uh, the most the most uh, uh, popular, uh, you know, within the population. So the most not, not that it's a real choice. I mean, you have to earn Kundalini, and so. Most of the people on this planet are not quite ready yet, but they're getting there. They're moving towards it. And it's slowly but surely, life after life, karma after karma, they are getting into the kundalini. For those of you who are already there, don't think that your karmic responsibilities stop just because you have the kundalini. Your karmic responsibilities in actuality increase. Okay. As you move into these exalted areas, you know, these exalted areas contain exalted responsibilities. And so, once again, for this, for this new year, this beautiful, wonderful year, 2013, I want to encourage you to reach into your social and physical environment with this level of divine love that those of, that are having Kundalini right now, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of you are reaching for kundalini as you reach for kundalini if you begin to emulate the behavioral understandings and expressions of a person that has kundalini you begin to understand and through that understanding you begin to have the opening occur for you if that is what you're seeking so this is this is my main objective uh, right now with with regards to the new year. I'm not asking you to, to, you know, to make a new year decision about whether you're going to lose weight or not, or, you know, are you going to stop smoking cigarettes, or are you going to, you know, you know, any, any of the, the, the new year uh, resolutions that people like to make. Uh, I am going to suggest to become a walking, talking angel, saint upon this world. It is not as difficult as it seems, especially for those that have the kundalini. It drives you to do this. It compels you. It will come to you. The energy waves will come up and it will expand through your body and immediately the tears will start to flow. Some of you begin sobbing with the, 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 the level of love, the level of intense energy is so strong. It doesn't hurt. It's not a painful thing for the most part. But you'll be compelled to commit acts of love and service and beauty upon complete strangers. You know, strangers, family, friends, animals, plants, it doesn't matter. Okay, what, you don't, what you're not able to see at the moment is is the level that the radiance extends from your body. Okay? That's very important to understand. You have to understand that the radiance of Kundalini is is huge. It's a big, big footprint. Uh, And so people will walk into your radiance without knowing it because they can't see it, but they can feel it. So as you're going through your environment and you're being this loving, beautiful, caring, service-oriented person, that is the dynamic of the the radiance field that they walk into. However, if you're still working through a lot of issues and you're going through fears and you're, you know, say you're having a top-down kundalini activation due to recreational drug intake, things of that nature, uh, and you're having a really, really difficult time, well, that is the field that everybody will be walking into. Okay? So really do your best to adopt a a St. Francis of Assisi uh, line of, of interaction with the populations of the world. And I, I, I don't just mean the human populations. I mean the the insect, the, the mammalian, the, 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 the fish, the plant, the, the microbial, the, the, vir- the viral, all 
of the creation of this wonderful planet that we are so blessed to live upon. Bring that positive Kundalini uh, divine love into your radiance field so that wherever you go, wherever you go, you begin to balance out the, the level of negativity that has been happening and continues to happen in this world. We are part of that balance. You know, the Kundalini people are, are, are those who really, really project a broad radiance field. And it, it is our responsibility as, as uh, realized individuals to bring that realization uh, into a loving, helpful uh, uh, equation. So think about that and think about the different ways that you can do this. For those that are having Kundalini right now, Kundalini will often direct you in which way it wants you to to promote that kind of an agenda. Helping a person cross the street, letting people cut in front of you on the freeway, um, buying a person lunch uh, or dinner or giving somebody some money or giving somebody a ride or offering to help somebody that's been injured or hurt, uh, the many, many, many different opportunities we have to help our fellow human, our fellow mortal, and I say that meaning animals and insects and plants, on this planet. Really, really focus on that for this new year. Let 2013 be the year of Kundalini. And, and if you look at it, it's the year of the serpent already. And the serpent uh, in the Kundalini context is the Kundalini energy going up the spine, the spinal cord. If, if you take away the, 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 the bone structures from your spinal column, what you have is the spinal cord. And because we're upright bipedal uh, um, human, you know, homo erectus, uh, our spinal cord resembles a snake standing on its tail. And when that kundalini comes up and it you know, comes all the way up into the brain and then out, out through the, uh, the third eye or the sixth chakra and then starts to, to circle uh, in, a, in, a, in a long flow uh, up the spine, down the front channels, up the spine, down the front channels, things of that nature, uh, and there are different there are different flows too, and I'll get into that in, a, in another show. Uh, different flow rates and flow directions uh, within the Kundalini. But as 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 you do this, and as you as you allow this understanding to to take hold of you, that you'll see that the year of the serpent really is the year of the Kundalini. This is the Kundalini year. <laughs> I, I really want to encourage you. And then I want to invite you to live your kundalini life to the fullest this year, right now. Uh, moving, moving within that, within that understanding, um, I, I receive uh, you know quite a few emails from people uh, having kundalini issues, and you know one of the issues that I that I've come into lately is that people expect a lot of phenomena from their kundalini. You know, even if it came to came to them unasked for, oh my gosh, they they have the highest expectations of specific symptoms and phenomena, psychic phenomena. They want to be able to move the car with their mind or fly or, you know, do any of these things that you can actually do. But you're only allowed to do them within a certain context. Okay. It's very, very contextual. The kundalini. It's not something that just, you know, you get. And it's not like pouring gasoline in your in your in your gas tank or petrol, as some people like to call it, and then turning the key on the car and there you go. It's not like that at all. I mean, there are very very specific uh, responsibilities that a person has to have. So, for instance, self-aggrandizement. You're trying to get, if you're going into kundalini and trying to get kundalini so that you can show your friends. Oh, look, you know, I can lift this car with my mind. You probably won't get it. If you have kundalini and you're, you're going after that 
that skill will not come. There's a level of purity that the human vessel needs to come into. And part of the purity, aside from obvious uh, uh, purities of diet and, and physical maintenance and things of that nature, are behavioral purity. And if you look in the safety protocols uh, that are written at the Kundalini Awakening Systems 1.com, and that's the number one.com, uh, you go to the left-hand margin and you'll see the safeties there in the menu. Click on the safeties, print those out, and read them. And read them very, very clearly to yourself. There, you know, Many people tell me, oh, yeah, I'm doing the safeties. And even other people tell me, oh, I've been doing the safeties all my life. And I just kind of cringe a little bit at that because obviously they're not doing the chin lock and the tongue lock and the eye lock and the finger lock and you know, all the other locks and bandas. They're not doing that, but evidently they've been doing it all their life. Um, I want you to take clear notice of the behavioral aspects of the safety protocols, forgiveness, tolerance, honesty, truth, patience, diligence, compassion. These are just as important as the five Tibetans or meditation or any of the other aspects of the safety protocols, and they, they speak to what, uh, what I'm uh, talking about at this point, is the level of behavioral purity that we have uh, within the kundalini. A lot of people say, oh, oh, you know, my kundalini, I don't have the karma for kundalini gifts. Well, you know, I might not agree with that because... Sometimes, yes, it is of a karmic nature and, and, and the gifts that you, that you receive will be of a karmic nature. But other times, it's just, you know, the person needs to make some behavioral changes in their level of expectation. If you expect to have specific forms of phenomena, whether it's telepathy to telekinesis to bilocation, whatever it is, then you can also expect not to have them because of your expectation of wanting them. Allow the kundalini to come to you with the blessed skills and the suite of skills that it wants to bring to you without you attaching an expectation to it. Many times an expectation will form a blockage. And the blockage, of course, you know, does does exactly that. It blocks uh, a certain divine expression from coming through. And so do your very best not to, to wrap yourself up into an expectation. Just let the kundalini flow through you, transform you, change you, and kind of see where this is happening for you. You know, a lot of people will go through the different levels of experience of the Kriyas, Natural experience, uh, the, the voices are seeing the entities, natural experience, uh, the, the special skills, um, uh, everything from telepathy, telekinesis to many of the uh, different uh, skill sets that come through. Let, let these things happen naturally as the Kundalini wants to express them. As you give service to other people, so will your symptoms increase. The more you give of a love-based service to other people, I have noticed, the more you're opening yourself, having the phenomena that, that are, you know, very popular to have, like telepathy and whatnot. But I have to warn you. You know, people think, oh, telepathy, that's such a fun thing to have. I can read the minds of other people, you know. And and what you really want to look at is, oh, my gosh, is it any of my business to read the mind of other people? Is that an ethical thing to do? Is that not something like an invasion of privacy? Already, you know, I have plenty of people that I work with privately that are being clued through their dream life, that they're being prepared to be able to read the minds of other people. 
And I just, you know, I want to caution you. Every kundalini skill has a downside to it. If, if, if the downside of that expression is something that you need to learn from. So let's just talk about telepathy right now. The downside of telepathy is having no filtration, having no filters, which means that you'll hear everybody's thoughts all at the same time, and it'll drive you crazy. Not only will you hear their thoughts, but you'll hear and feel their despair, their rage, their anger, their terror, their fear, their their self-invalidation, uh, their, their joy, their love, their happiness. You'll feel it all at the same time. No filtration. It's not a fun experience. It can just blow your mind until the Kundalini gives you filters that allow you, you know, instead of a broadband telepathic uh, experience, you get a narrow band telepathic experience. And, and hopefully, you know, if you're using it well, a narrow band by choice uh, telepathic experience, then it can be very, very, very difficult to have that. And not only, not only will you tie into what other humans are feeling and thinking, but you'll tie into the survival realms of the insects and the animals and the, all of conscious life, whether it's human consciousness or not, expresses within the telepathic range. And so you get all of that. And boy, if you think that static uh, at the beginning of the show was bad, boy, you ought to try some broadband telepathy with no filters. It's mind-numbing. And literally, you having a numb mind would be a gift in that scenario. So there are, no, you know, it is not all peaches and cream when it comes to these uh, symptoms. Uh, but you need to understand that. You need to understand what it is you're desiring, if it is indeed that, that you're desiring uh, the special skills and phenomena of Kundalini. So I get people coming up to me and saying, oh, you know, this, is, this isn't divine. This isn't, this isn't anything, you know. You know, I'm just going to stop believing in any of this. This is all you know, baloney because I'm not getting the, you know, the uh, the expected results. Well, you know, it, it'll it'll continue to be that way unless, of course, it has a, a you know a special agenda within your Kundalini awakening for you to experience that, and then boom, once you start denying it, well, then it'll start you know it'll start coming at you harder. So just be aware of that. And this goes for a lot of the people that are having the top-down experience. For those who are having a top-down kundalini awakening, which means starting at the seventh crown chakra and working its way down, basically going from refinement into density, I want you to know right now that it's going to feel crazy to you. It will feel absolutely nuts. You'll feel like you're going nuts, but you're not. But you'll have that sensation when you're sitting alone in your in your home or you know wherever you are in your car, wherever. You know you'll you'll have various psychic phenomena that you would not normally have, and you know a lot of it is due, to, especially if you're doing psilocybin or LSD, you know, or some of these you know extreme mind altering uh, uh, entheogens or, or, or plants. Uh, uh, or artificial chemicals. Uh, this, this, the top down can be extremely difficult, and it also opens you up for entity interaction as well. So be advised of that. Make sure that you're you're working and living and, and operating from a love based perspective, a helpful service based scenario. This will help you tremendously, as will all of the safety protocols. But for those of you having a top down, breathe. Relax. I know it's hard. I know that you're hearing and seeing and feeling things that you would never have even dreamed of experiencing, and that is what it is. This is what happens sometimes when you when you storm the gates of heaven. Sometimes this type of a response occurs. You're not crazy. You're just having an expanded uh, sensorial experience due to the kundalini awakening within you. Uh, because of that recreational uh, uh, use, use of those of those compound components. So know this, understand this, be okay with this. 
practice the safeties minus the five Tibetans, because you've got enough of that going on. And uh, as you work those protocols, uh, you'll be able to kind of meet in the middle as the, as the uh, top of the head works down to the third eye and then to the throat. Well, you can also start working from the bottom, the first chakra, second, third, and both of the activation points will meet at the heart. And the heart activation will then begin. And that is really a good place to be. So you have extremely positive options, you top downers. You have extremely positive options, and you just need to keep it. Understand what has occurred. Number one, Kundalini's been awakened. Number one. Okay, there it is. Okay. Number two, uh, avoid any of the uh, conversations that entities might try to inflict upon you. Avoid doing anything that is hurtful, negative, or uh, retributional to another person. And begin to operate and live your life through a level of strong, strong, strong forgiveness and strong, strong, strong service of love for others. Okay. Uh, you can actually do the five Tibetans. I'm going to take that back because I, I, I want you to be able to do at least the, the first four uh, to meet at the heart. To meet at the heart. The five Tibetans are a form of Kundalini activation. This is what gives them all of their fantastic uh, results. Hair growth, you know, extended uh, meat, that type of thing. Uh, so this is why they're, they're incorporated into the safeties. So for those of you that are having a bottom to top, the same advice goes to you. Uh, it's still... You know, you'll still think you're going a little crazy if you don't know what it is that's occurring. For those of you that do know what is occurring, it doesn't make it. It does make it easier. You know what's occurring, but you know you're still having the kriyas. You're still having the severe mood swings. You're still seeing the visions. You're still seeing the lights. You're still hearing the voices, hearing the celestial music. You're still in that angel development stage. That angel or saint, use whatever symbol is is appropriate for you, development stage. And and within that context, uh, it, it can be a, a difficult learning curve. A lot of you, and I'm just going to go out here on a limb and say this, um, a lot of you will start feeling little bulges and knobs at your shoulder blade. And a lot of people have, you know, with their with their third eye vision, they can see their wings growing. Uh, this is, this is <laughs> as fantastic as it sounds and as you know weird as it sounds, this is a real deal. This is not something that, you know, I'm just pulling out of my parka. This is this is a this is a real thing that people are having this occur. And you are, you know, typically being changed into something that is of a positive, helpful nature on this world. Uh, it's not for you to go into a cave. You may want to go into a cave. I wanted to go into a cave. I was on my way to a cave. Okay? But there are responsibilities to, to your fellow mortal that cannot be denied. You don't get to be a hermit. You get to live in this social environment and be that beacon of hope, that beacon of healing, that lighthouse of love. This is, this is what you get. Whether or not you have blog talk, radio, or you, you do what I do, this, you know, that's not a requirement. The only requirement really is that you do what you like to do and you help others you know, do what, what they like to do, what, what is helpful for them. You spread that love. You live that love. Okay. So, you know, I, I kind of manipulated this conversation back to the goal for the year 2013 is to be that service-oriented person. Um, I would like to open up uh, the call lines now, and I think uh, the call number is 347 Nine three four zero zero two six. Amelia, are there any questions or anything that I can answer at this point? 
Yes, Susan, there are no live callers at this point, but there are some emails, so I can read some of those. One you have answered already, I think. The question was, how does doing the five Tibetans assist with Kundalini awakening? Do you want to say I'm, more on that? Yeah, I can, I can do that. And you're starting to break up again. I'm, we're going to have to figure out a way to... Perhaps it's Skype. I don't know. Cause it could be. It could be. Five Tibetans. The most important of the Tibetans from a Kundalini context is the first Tibetan. The first Tibetan is done with your fingers together but stretched out perpendicular to your body, which means stretched out so that your 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 arms are 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 pointing to whatever direction, but they're up. Not over your head, just kind of shoulder length. And then you spin clockwise. You spin Spin to the right, slowly at first. For those of you that have never done the five Tibetans, I counsel people only doing six spins because you're going to get dizzy. You're supposed to get dizzy. Dizzy is not a bad thing in this context. Dizzy is a very good thing. And uh, uh, for those of you uh, who, who may, you know, English isn't the first language, dizzy is that that uh, feeling that you get when you, you know, after you've spun around as a child, you know what that feels like. So whatever that word is in, in your language, you know, that's what I'm referring to. I want you to feel dizzy. Dizzy is what you're going to feel is because that little micro amount of kundalini has been released at the base of your spine. Then you do the second Tibetan, you know, the laying down on your back and and lifting your legs uh, up to your chest or your knees up to your chest. Uh, this pulls the kundalini from the first chakra to the second chakra, to the Dan Chen chakra. Okay? And then you do the third Tibetan, and the third Tibetan pulls the energy from the first to the second to the third, and then the fourth Tibetan, you know, goes from the first, second, third to the fourth, and so on and so forth, and you stop at the throat chakra. That's where that's the last chakra that gets that kind of a treatment. The other two chakras are being are, are way too sensitive for that type of a of a of an energetic pull to be helpful. So that's that's how the five Tibetans help Kundalini. It actually releases a very small amount. Small enough so that you know some of its great gifts can be given the the youthfulness and things of that nature. And a lot of people say to me, well, well, Kristen, you don't look that young. You don't look that young. You don't look like, you know, you've, you've been uh, well-preserved. And I say, well, you know, I've got a beard. Uh, but, yeah, I, it's not ever something that I've wanted to be. I've, you know, when even as a, as a child... I saw myself as an older person with a beard. So that has been my model to follow, and the Kundalini is just basically following, helping me follow that model. Um, you know, we're not all addicted to the young is better uh, uh, social model that that uh, that we have in our society in the West. Young is not always better, in my opinion. Young can be very, very difficult sometimes. Look at look at some of these, you know, tragedies that are happening to children. This is not an easy life to live sometimes. And so, for me, uh, young is not the thing. Healthy, however, healthy is good. Healthy is good. And the Kundalini will help you with your health. It will also give others the opportunity to help you if you are not healthy. And in that context, I just want to let you know that on Facebook and on Yahoo, there are groups called Kundalini Healing. And this is where we give people with the Kundalini or people that are wanting to have Kundalini an opportunity to give that loving service of health and grace to another person that they do not know. It's one thing to give it to a friend. It's one thing to give it to a family member. But it's something completely different 
to give it to an absolute stranger. That is the most powerful gift. That that changes society. Okay. In a positive way. So the five Tibetans are exceptionally helpful. They're a form of Tibetan yoga and it's vertical yoga. Vertical yoga, meaning it just goes up and down, up and down. It never goes side, side to side. Okay? There's no spinal twisting with this, to, these aspects of Tibetan yoga, the five Tibetans. It's up and down, which is exactly what the Kundalini wants to do. It just wants to go up and down. That's one of the main cycles, one of the main flows that it does. It goes up and it goes down. It goes up and goes down. You go up and you have the activation and then you have the apana, which comes down, which is the release, and it, so it's a, it's a, it's a self-feeding process that never stops, never goes away. Your phenomena may change. Your phenomena may, you may feel like your phenomena disappeared. And that may be the case, but the kundalini hasn't gone away. You know, you're just what, in what I call a plateau experience. If your phenomena disappears, you know, all of a sudden, oh, I can't read these minds, or oh, I can't, you know, do this or that. Um, it doesn't mean that anything's wrong. It just means that the amount of information and transformation that you have received at this point needs to be processed without phenomena, without that expectation of doing this, this, or that. Kundalini is a very, very, very intelligent force, and it looks at you, and it looks at how you are, how you are doing with this energy, with itself within you, and based upon how you are doing, and it doesn't mean whether you're doing good or bad, I mean, that has something to do with it, but it's more about how your physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and spiritual body are processing this this intense form of energy. Kundalini is, is, is similar to going from a 12-volt car battery to a 12-million-volt battery. I mean, it's a huge, huge, huge upgrade, and it's a very delicate process, and the Kundalini knows this process better than your ego mind knows the process. And so, once again, we surrender our control of the Kundalini process to the Kundalini or to a teacher that you have that has the Kundalini. Sometimes a, 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 an embodiment, a physical embodiment, as in a teacher with Kundalini, is the, is the way to go for a person. There is a place for that in our, in our society, in the awakening aspects of our society. I, I often uh, speak of... Uh, dead teachers versus living teachers. And living teachers are extremely important. Somebody who's walking and talking and breathing the same air that you're breathing right now, having kundalini, right now, maybe he's had kundalini a lot longer in a, in a, in a more intensive way. And, and, you know, this is not the first lifetime having the kundalini, et cetera, et cetera. You know, can give you some really solid, helpful information that will allow you to excel and surrender and forgive and do all the wonderful love-based uh, behavioral modifications that the Kundalini provides for you to do. So I do, I do have a, you know, I am a teacher, and so of course, you know, I feel that uh, a living teacher is a very, very, very important part of the Kundalini. Uh, understanding of life as it is lived on this world, and, and uh, dead teachers also have their have their place. Uh, you know, a dead teacher isn't going to, you know, they they can come to you in a spiritual form, uh, and they're just not going to be able to or, or choose to give you as much. Uh, physical-based instruction as a physical-based teacher would do. So, uh, uh, Santara, can you give me the next question? I can, Chris, indeed. And um, it's from Trisha. 
And it's connected with Kundalini Healing. She says, thank you for your shows. She enjoys the two of them very much. And she's wondering what the difference between Kundalini Healing and Reiki Healing is. Okay, no, that's very good. Hello, Trisha. Uh, thank you for asking the question. It's a very good question. Uh, uh, Dr. Usui, uh, back in the 20s, uh, was the person, the first person uh, within the Reiki context that developed uh, the healing formats that, that he called Reiki, which means life force in, in Japanese. Uh, Dr. Asui was this wonderful uh, medical professional uh, who would do he, his his practice was located in a slum, so people paid him off with eggs or chickens or you know very basic uh, 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 survival uh, rewards for the medical care that he would give to them. He did this for a number of years. He's a very, very... Dr. Usui was a guy meant to have kundalini. He was living a kundalini life. And, oh, my gosh, if some of our doctors today could emulate Dr. Usui, how cool would that be? And there are, they are out there. I've met them. There, there are, there's a certain level of, uh, of medical professional in our, in our world right now who are exactly that way with Dr. Usui. And I tip my hat to them. I really do getting a little bit of uh, bliss as I talk about this. So if you hear me pausing, that's why. Oh, it's so strong. Bliss, when it comes, you just, you have to stop and let it let it take its course. Um, Dr. Usui, uh, you know, he, he worked and he worked and he worked and he, he always meditated and gave himself time for that introspection, the inner journey. And uh, his life uh, continued, and, and he decided he needed to climb uh, a mountain that was nearby. I forget the name of the mountain, but it's not important. He climbed the mountain, and he decided that he was going to stay meditating in this cave, looking out the mouth of the cave, until he received some sort of divine instruction. He had reached a point where he was so hungry, for divine instruction that he was going to put it all on the line. And he did. And he went up and uh, he, he meditated and it took him, he was up there for for two weeks uh, and he made the point that at that point he decided, I'm just not going to come down. If I don't receive it, then I'm just going to die here. I'm, I'm going to die. So you, you, you got to understand that this man is... He's putting it all on the line, people. He is putting it all on the line. How many of you are willing to put it all on the line that way? Very difficult. So he put it all on the line, and he, he waited three weeks, and then three weeks off in the distance, he saw a light off in the horizon, and this light uh, grew brighter and brighter, and he could tell that it was coming at him. And it came at him, and it hit him on his head, and boom, he began to have a top-down activation. Uh, his activation was far more due to what he had done in his life up to that point, the way he had lived his life, the service that he had given other people, day in, day out, patient after patient after patient, Okay. Dr. Sui really, really, God, what a great guy. I mean, I can't speak highly enough of that man. Anyway, so he, he activated his kundalini that way. The kundalini came to him and changed him, and, and he began to do the hands-on uh, Reiki style of healing. Uh, after his death, the ownership issues of well, you know, I'm a direct descendant of Dr. Usui, and you're not, and therefore you can't have this, this, or that. And all of this uh, political uh, posturing and, 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 and power-mongering began to occur uh, in the people who had worked with him and the family of him. And, and this, this 
kind of expanded into a a real commercial. Somehow, <laughs> somehow people started selling. Uh, what do they call them? Um, Shiftar, help me. What is that thing that you get when you buy a Reiki master? Oh, an attunement, I think, is it? An attunement. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. An attunement. So you begin to, you know, people begin to sell attunements, you know, and, and they, you know, it, it seemed like they were making it up as they went along. You know, you'd have peppermint stick Reiki and dolphin Reiki and Karuna Reiki and, and you know, Gingerbread Reiki and all of these different Reiki came up. And I think it, it did a real disservice to the actual Reiki that Dr. Sui was practicing. You don't need symbols. He used symbols, and that's fine. And if symbols help you, fine, fine, as long as you're doing good work. But the other thing that I really, really differentiates Kundalini healing from Reiki is the use of entities. Kundalini people do not use entities to heal. Certainly not sticking their hands up in the air and going, healing masters of the universe, plug into my hands and let me give the healing to this person. Because of what we know about the lack of ethics with entities, in many, if not most cases, what is being given is an entity infestation to a person who is already sick. Kundalini people, he, Kundalini healing is not that way. Kundalini healing, you basically stand near the person and the Kundalini itself within you, it'll, it'll actually, you can feel it pouring out of your chest, pouring out of your hand chakras, into that person. And the Kundalini knows what that person needs to receive. It knows that person's karma. Okay. The Reiki person does not. Now, I can't say this about all Reiki. You know, a lot of the, you know, not all Reiki is, you know, sticking your hands up in the air and saying, whatever entity, come on in. Um, a lot of, uh, of Reiki uh, is, is, is based on the Based, I should say, based on the Dr. Asui model, uh, but without, you know, and this is very important, it's without the refinement that Dr. Asui gave himself through his selfless service in life. So, Trisha, if you can do that selfless service, if you can live that kind of a life where you you help, 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 and even help when it's hard to help. You are activating areas in your body that will open to the kundalini flow within you. By practicing Reiki, you can, if you do it within that, within that model, you can activate the kundalini, and the kundalini will flow through you just as hard as it flows through Yogananda or, 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 or uh, you know, any of the... Indian mystical saints or any of the uh, any any person that has uh, awakened Kundalini, Trisha, I really really encourage you to Reiki is a good thing. It just needs to be practiced in a specific way that doesn't cause more problems, you know, than 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 the person had coming into the treatment. Don't stick your hands up in the air and say entities plug in. Please don't do that. I don't care. I don't care what guidance people think they have. Okay, healing master this or healing master that or Saint Germain or Saint whoever. No, no, no. The only true divine interaction is with the Kundalini within you. The Kundalini within you is the source that is true. You see, now I'm starting to get poetic on you. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the bliss. <laughs> but you can, Trisha, you can use that as a mantra. The kundalini in you is the source that is true. Okay? You get to know that kundalini, and and your the healings that you want to give will be powerful, very, very powerful. Santara, 
Yes. I would like to speak to Trisha a little bit about uh, what you've been doing within a Kundalini healing modality. Okay. Well, I have been, um, but recently Kundalini invited me or told me to become a massage therapist and I did training for that. And the reason was to be a therapist. And I, I give Kundalini massage. And what I do is before I go and um, give the massage, I go into devotion. I go into a place with my Kundalini and my Kundalini moves and does the healing, does the massage. It's uh Suntara? Yes. Can you try backing off of the mic a little bit? Actually, Chrism, you're sounding very you're sounding very um broken up to me. Can you speak? can't hear you. Stand by. I'm going to put my mic on hold for a minute, okay? Hello? Hang on. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, you're very clear, so go right ahead. Okay, so I will. I don't do anything. When I am giving a Kundalini healing, I open, I go there, and I the Kundalini does it. It's 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 very difficult to actually explain, but I can feel the Kundalini within me moving out through my hands, moving through my heart. It moves in different ways um, through me in whatever way the Kundalini sees fit for the person that I am giving a massage to or that I am giving a healing to. And so it's different for every person. It's not always the same. And I do not impose anything upon it except of my own. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank um, you. Sorry. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's exactly right. One of the key uh, scenarios, uh, Tricia, was what, what uh, Santara mentioned was devotion. What does devotion mean to you? What does that word mean? Devotion in the in the Kundalini context is love for the Kundalini or love for a source of the Kundalini. Love, extreme love, love that allows you to surrender yourself completely into the arms of that Kundalini source, whether it's a teacher or whether it's... Uh, uh, a representative of the Kundalini for you, whatever that may be. Uh, devotion makes a huge difference in the level of love and the power of a healing that is given within the Kundalini context. Uh, so with the Kundalini healing, the more love you have of the Kundalini and surrender that you have to the Kundalini, the greater the flow rate will come out of your chest, your eyes, your throat, your hands, and your fingertips. These are all vectors of kundalini healing expressions. Okay. With Reiki, I know that you you know you know you're you're floating your hands over the person and you're looking for heat spots and things like that. And I understand that. I'm you know I have no problem with that, but with kundalini it is it is it is more than just your hands. It is your entire body. It's your soul. It's your spirit. It's, your, it's everything that constitutes the person that you are plus the divine aspect. Okay? The divine aspect that comes through. It is 50, if not, it is, sometimes it's more than 50% of the equation. And there is nothing that the divine cannot heal on this planet. Nothing. Having created the planet, it knows. It knows what needs to be done. Okay, but those are some of the main differences between uh, Reiki and Kundalini. And I just wanted to get into the history of Reiki because Reiki started out as Kundalini. It is Kundalini, but not now. It's been commercialized almost, you know, definitely to its own detriment. 
but not by everyone. Not by everyone. And I'm certainly not suggesting this, you know, about you, Trisha, or anybody that's practicing Reiki. I'm just saying that, you know, buying and selling attunements and creating Reiki this, Reiki that, uh, may have taken away some of the important principles of refinement that are necessary for Kundalini to flow uh, within that healing uh, uh, construct that Dr. Isui created. Thank you, Trishna. And I hope I hope that answered your question to some degree. Are there other questions, Amelia? Yes, there are, Chrism. Um, let me see. Um a person asks two questions. Um, at what stage in one's life is a kundalini awakening likely to happen? And and then how come this person knows no well-known politician that is kundalini active? I suppose how come there's no well-known politician that is kundalini active or appears to be? Okay, all right. I think Abraham Lincoln had some kundalini going with him. Okay, but that's, you know, that's almost impossible to prove at this point. Uh, the typical age for Kundalini, one of the most observable ages that I've been exposed to is the 30s. When you're 30, when you're a trinity, uh, when you're 21, when you're 18, when you're, you know, 27, uh, 26, but mostly 30. In the 30s, somewhere. Okay, that's that's been the age that I've seen. But I also there is a hidden mathematics to Kundalini. And that's the mathematics of of the Trinity of threes, of what adds up to three, uh, you know, or, or, or uh, a derivation of three, like nine or six. Uh, those are very important points when it comes to Kundalini, and uh, there's a whole mathematical science of mystical mathematics that is is dedicated to this subject, so I can't go into it too much, but uh, with regards to the ages of activation, I'll say that 30 is the typical age. Now, with regards to politicians, yeah, yeah, politicians. I have, to, I have to be very charitable here now. Uh, politicians, many politicians are controlled by aspects of their constituents that do not open them to having kundalini, i.e., they are controlled by uh, greed-based money interests. I won't say all of them, but many of them are pulled into that type of a mess. And, you know, they begin to feel more loyal to those that are giving them money than to those who elected them to do the job for the for the populations. And uh, this can be seen in many, 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 uh, if not most, of uh, the, the politicians here in the United States. Um including, yes, you know, Barack Obama and, and all of the other politicians uh, from him on down. Uh, this is subject to, this is starting to change. Um, a lot of politicians depend upon how the media treats them for re-election. And so if they want to keep their job, then they have to please certain, you know, hurtful aspects of their constituency. And so, you know, a... An, an enlightened uh, voice in the Senate or the or the or the House of Representatives is not impossible. It's just not probable. But but there are certain forces that are guiding these politicians. It's interesting. You know the the guidances mostly will occur when the politicians are asleep. And their psyches will be visited by divine uh, consciousness. And divine consciousness will counsel them by giving them a, uh, you know, something that compels them to make a certain decision this way or that. 
you must understand that life on this world is not meant to be easy for everyone. It is people come here with different karma, different karma demands, different types of of uh, living environments and living experiences. And so, if, you know, if, if if a person is coming into this question with, well, how come, how come everybody, you know, doesn't get to have a a flat screen TV, a, a, a PT cruiser, and uh, you know, a, a nice place to live. Well, it's, that that is not the way it's set up here in this world. Not everybody gets to be Bill Gates. Not everybody gets to be the the poorest uh, person in the Sudan. Okay, but we have uh, levels of interaction that we go through that allow us to burn enough karma so that we can perhaps become those things. We're not limited in what we become. The only limitation that we're brought here with is, one, the limitations we gave to ourselves through the karmic experience. And so from that karmic experience, we are unlimited in how how much karma we can burn. Typically, you know, the Chinese curse is may you have your karma, may you meet your karma in one life, you know, and so that means it's going to be a very difficult life. Well, Kundalini does that to you in many, many ways. Kundalini forces you to balance previous lifetimes of karma all in one life, which is why you you see a lot of uh, Kundalini people having very, very difficult childhoods. Childhood is often where a lot of your karma gets balanced, a lot of it. Uh, so, with regards to the politicians, yeah, not yet, my friend, not yet, but I see a time when a person like you or a person like me or a person like Santara or a person like Yogananda or a person like, you know, Ramakrishna will seek political office in order to initiate some enlightened change upon this world when that time is right. Obviously, it's not quite right yet. Another question, Santara? Yes, there's another one. You answered half of it, I think, because it just said, can you say more about what you mean by karma in relation to Kundalini? So, oh, okay. I think... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Believe me. Karma, <laughs> karma, karma is a huge subject with Kundalini. All souls refine themselves towards enlightenment, whether they know it or not. All souls are in a constant form of refinement towards the divine expression. That divine expression in the first phase is the Kundalini. Within that refinement process, Certain experiences need to be to be had. You need to know what it is to be bad as well as what it is to be good. You need to know what it is to be off the path in order to know what it is to be on the path. So in many ways, we must have difficult karma to some degree so that we know what to do. We, we, we've learned. We, we, you kind of keep what you, the goodness that you've, that, that you've expressed in other lifetimes, you keep as well as the not-so-goodness. Good karma and bad karma are both exist in equal measure. As you continue to refine yourself through the lifetime experience, going back into a body after you die, and then having that body go through its entire lifetime, and then it dies, and then you take another one, uh, by the way, in the in-between state, you do study what you did and how you did what you did in order to learn how you want to proceed with this next life in, in meeting the karmic requirements. So as you live this life, you're living your karma. You're meeting your karma. Kundalini people, they get to meet a lot of the karma that they haven't quite cleaned up yet. And a lot of this can be really difficult karma. Oh, my God, you just don't know. Uh, childhood sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, 
not just from parents, but from perfect strangers. Uh, uh, very, very, very extremely difficult things, experiences, just in order to burn that karma. Just in order to burn that karma enough so that they can have the Kundalini experience in that lifetime. And then, just like karma, Kundalini doesn't die with the body. Kundalini is of a divine expression. And divine expressions do not die. They just keep on going. So the next life you have, after having a Kundalini life, you'll have Kundalini automatically in that other life. Unless, unless there are karmic derivations that say, okay, okay, uh, you know, uh, Chris is going to have Kundalini in this life, then he'll skip this next life with no Kundalini, then the next life he'll have Kundalini. Whatever, whatever the personal combination it is for that person to meet their karmic requirements, uh, the Kundalini comes with you when you die. It goes with you. You know, they say, oh, you can't take it with you. Well, you what really happens with Kundalini is it takes you with it. <laughs> Kundalini takes you with it when you die. And it comes in as it as it has with me. There's a motorcycle, so you'll excuse that sound in the background. Uh, the Kundalini uh, and its karmic requirement is fairly strong, fairly strong. Not only will it govern uh, how much karma you burn uh, in your early life and in, in, you know, as you continue through your life, but it will also govern what manifestations of kundalini will occur for you based also on your expression of, of the divine love and consciousness on the planet. Okay. Kundalini is not always easy, folks. I, I really want you to understand that. And those who have it know what I'm talking about. Kundalini syndrome is, is one example of that. But it doesn't have to go into syndrome. All you need is a little bit of information and your Kundalini awakening process will be very clear to you in a very understandable format. If you understand the karma behind it, do as you would be done by. Do the right thing within the understandings of the society that you live in. Always come into your expressions with other people through purity. Purity of intention. Not the easiest thing to do. Oh, that's a very easy and poetic thing to say, Mr. Christen, but that's not an easy thing to do. To be so consistent. Do your best, really, is all that I'm going to say. Do the best that you can do within uh, within the life and the and the and the experience of life that you're having right now. Do the very best that you can do and self correct. If you see yourself slipping and getting into revenge or getting into greed or getting into uh, pornography or getting into you know, make the self correction. And by pornography, I mean the uh, hurtfulness, the sexual hurtfulness of of a, of a person, not necessarily showing body parts. Body, I don't see that as, you know, even having sex, I don't see that as being pornographic at all. It's, you know, um, and I'll and I'll talk about tantra, I think, in a in another show. Um, I'm a I'm a very uh, I'm, I'm a I'm a supporter of tantra. I think tantra is really one of the most blessed forms of seeking kundalini that you can that you can experience. And I recommend Tantra. And I and I, I mean I mean it doesn't have to be full penetrative Tantra, but but I recommend all forms of Tantra, including penetrative Tantra as well. And I know a lot of people say, Oh, you don't have to penetrate that well, you know you know, people have different different strokes for different folks, I guess is how that works. Um, so yeah. Uh, I hope that answers that question about karma. Do we have other questions, Amelia? Yes. Um, Joe wishes you a very happy New Year, Chrism, and wonders um, what books would you recommend to a person who is curious and wants to find out more about Kundalini? Well, 
at the risk of of uh of being uh I would recommend the the website Kundalini Awakening one. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I mean I can only speak of that source because it's reflective of, of what the Kundalini has given me to say about the you know, about the, the awakening process. Um for a scientific viewpoint, you can check out Bonnie Greenwell's book. I forget what the title is, but her name's Greenwell, Bonnie Greenwell, Ph.D. Uh, Gopi Krishna's book is a is a is a is a horror story about a man that that uh, that had the Kundalini come to him in 1934, and how. You know, he, he didn't have a teacher. Like, kind of, he kind of had the same scenario I had, uh, and it does make it a difficult scenario if you don't have a teacher, if you don't have information. And Gopi Krishna, you know, he basically resisted Kundalini as much as he could and suffered terribly because of that resistance, as did I. So, really, everybody, everybody who's listening here, you surrender to Kundalini. Kundalini controls you. You do not control Kundalini. Kundalini does not surrender to your ego. Okay. Your ego and every other aspect of yourself surrenders to the Kundalini. Gives the Kundalini control over your body and your life and your mind and your feelings. It's already in control of your spirit. Okay. And it's a good thing. It's a, it's a divine, blessed thing. So don't think that you're, you know, uh, you know, exposing yourself to something bad. You're not. Um, yeah, books. Um, let's see, other books. Um, a lot of people like the biology of Kundalini. Um, and Jenna Dixon's great. She's written, I think, a really good book with that. Uh, but, you know, she, she's got a lot of her own flavoring. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, assumptions made in that book. You know, a lot of uh, um, absolutism. Uh, I find that Kundalini is different for each person. I cannot say that my kundalini is, is the same as Satara's kundalini is the same as anybody else's kundalini. I can't say that because we all came into this life with different karma. Therefore, the kundalini expression within us is going to be different. It's going to be unique. Yes, there will be very many similarities. There will be similarities. And, and I think Jana is speaking to a lot of the similarities. But uh, we are unique in our expression of kundalini. Uh, so those those books, I guess, uh, I would I would uh, suggest that people write, especially when you're reading Gopi Krishna, don't think that that's going to happen to you, because it's not. He didn't have anybody that knew what Kundalini was. They didn't even know it was Kundalini. And this is in India, by the way. So, yeah, yeah, it was a very difficult time for him. At this point, I would like to take the time to, to thank some, some folk. I'd like to, to thank Vibhav and his wife uh, for their special support of KAS-1 program, and myself in particular. I'd like to thank Amelia Centara. I would like to thank uh, 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 Rosemary. And I want, I'm not going to use everybody's last name because, you know, I think people have privacy issues around that. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Chrisum with a K in England. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, 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 gosh, I have I have all these letters in the car. I'd like to thank everybody who sent me a Christmas card and and gave me well wishes uh, for for Christmas and New Year. It's very much appreciated. I, I read all of them, and I and uh, I'm very grateful to all of you. I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, Magdalene, Magdalene, for for her special help and uh, and uh, friendship and uh, really, really uh, the people who who allowed me to give them Shakti Pot, uh, uh, 
for the 2012 winter solstice. Uh, I'd like to, to thank all of you. I'd like to thank all of the friends on Facebook, especially in the groups on Facebook, which is Kundalini Awakening Apostrophe, and then Kundalini Awakening Systems 1, uh, Kundalini Ashram, Christmas Private Students, and uh, the, Kunda, the, the Christmas uh, Shakti 2012 group. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the uh, Spiritual Lounge group and the owners of that group. I'd like to thank Eileen Laurel uh, for her help with this and Barbara Perry. And, um, and of course, Lasha for always being there. Um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Centara's husband for his support of her process, which, which helps all of us. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for making this show possible and, and allowing me to continue to do what it is that I do uh, with regards to the Kundalini. I'll be doing this weekly uh, as, as much as possible. I'll be doing it weekly. And I encourage you uh, who are visiting us in the archives to please... Uh, uh, go ahead and email a question to K-F-I-R-E-F-O-R-A-L-L at yahoo.com, and I will do my best to answer you. Um, we'll get better with this uh, blog talk radio scenario. Look, um, we'll try to find a, a, a phone or a, or a type of uh, communication device that allows us to, to come in clear. So thank you for your patience with that. Uh, so Tara? Yes, Cousin? Thank you. You're very welcome, and thank you. I enjoyed listening to everything that you taught today. It was wonderful. And thank you to everybody for listening, and apologies if the sound wasn't great today. As Cousin said, we will try and improve as best we can. So goodbye to everybody, and thank you, Cousin. Yes, yes. Uh, once again, I want to echo that. We'll get better with the with the blog talk. But in the meantime, really, really go into your kundalini. Let your kundalini go into you. Surrender to your kundalini and allow your enlightenment to begin. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Santara? Hello? 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 Anybody? Hello? Hello? Hi, who's this? My good... Okay, that's hey, my... Who is it? Hello, who is this? 